Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. It was 75 years ago that the Germans launched their last major offensive on the Western Front in World War II. December 16, 1944, kicked off a terrible, bloody six weeks of absolutely crushing losses on both sides. Attacked by the Germans in the Ardennes Forest, American soldiers encountered bad weather that prevented them from receiving air support. It was freezing. They were short on supplies. Yet they fought on, and they won, finally, but not without terrible human cost. 75,000 U.S. troops were killed. Another 5,000 were captured or injured. It's been called a, quote, statistic unprecedented in American history. And there in the battle for that grueling, terrifying period was a 22-year-old man from Pocahontas, Illinois. His name was Louis Bashevsky, but people called him Looch. And the story of his war experience is now a documentary film. It's called Path of the Past, and it was made by his grandson, who's also Lou Bashevsky. The film has a free screening tomorrow morning at the Soldiers Memorial in downtown St. Louis. And here today to talk to us about it is its director, Lou Bashevsky. Lou, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Now, Lou, you say your grandfather spoke little of his time in World War II before you began to sit down and very consciously draw this out of him. What did you grow up knowing about his time overseas? It was really just the vagaries. He uh, was a very humble person, and he consistently would just say, I was just a tanker. I was just a tank driver. Uh, But it wasn't until we really dug into writing the book, Luch, uh, they worked together on it that kind of his experiences broke open like a dam and he was willing to share his experiences. What made you decide to take this more proactive approach of getting him to tell his story in the great detail when when you first began working on this book project? I I think it it came to a point where he... felt the need to share it, I believe. He felt comfortable enough to do so. And what I found out later, I didn't know it at the time when we started, was we were actually doing a a therapy that the VA employs now, which is called narrative therapy. Mm -hmm. It allows veterans or anyone that has gone through a traumatic experience to put it down in a way that allows them to conceptualize the whole thing rather than be these kind of scattered, uh, very dark and frightening experiences. It, it, it puts it together in a narrative. So sort of to start at point A and then to talk about and what happened next and what happened next, that's part of that therapy. Correct. And in, in, in the process of researching all that I did and all the things surrounding his experiences, it allowed me to tell him while he was still with us the larger, broader context of what he is, was part of. Whereas in the actual war, he just had a periscope to look through. He only knew what his tank commander was telling him. He only knew the vagaries of what was going on. Sort of one foot ahead of the other, not thinking about these giant armies moving around the continents. Correct. And so he didn't himself want to research deeply into this. It was too difficult to do so, uh, to dig up those memories. But once we worked together, he got to a point it was pretty amazing. He was almost as eager to talk about it as I was, and it was very therapeutic for him. He actually thanked me for many years to come to for doing it. Now, for those of you listening, we do want to invite you to join our conversation. Did you experience combat, and how were you able to deal with your experiences in that? You can give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us a tweet at STL on air, or email us at talk at stlpublicradio.org. Now, what ended up happening to your grandfather's story is is certainly unusual in terms of, of combat veterans. Here he had you being this very careful listener. It turned into a book, and that and that book ended up turning into a documentary film. And for the film, you traveled to France and then Belgium following your grandfather's footsteps. That's more than 400 miles by bike and then the rest by car. Let's listen. The airplane seat was cramped and claustrophobic in my mandatory space for at least 10 hours. On Lucha's trip, he sat in a much less comfortable seat and for 10 months, living fighting and sleeping in a metal box. 
10 months of ceaseless combat put then private Luch Bezeski through hell. Yet somehow, he later returned home when many others didn't. While his division lost 580% of their tanks throughout the war, Luch's crew survived from France to Germany and in the same tank. The man who survived all of this was the same quiet, stoic man who taught me how to fish, despite all the horrors that he carried with him. And that's from Lou Bashevsky's film, Path of the Past. Lou, what made you realize that a book wasn't enough, that you also had to do this film? Well, uh, Grandpa, uh, Grandpa and I had spoken about it quite a few times and really kind of looked at going over to Europe uh, together to actually go through these places. And unfortunately, he passed away in uh, 2013. And I was in kind of a transitional phase myself, having changed from being a teacher to going back to a different trade. And uh, I also went through kind of a pretty tough divorce and stuff at the time. So it was, it, it, it was something I knew would get my mind off and focus on something bigger than myself and uh, try to make a contribution uh, to this story that was so important to me and my whole family. So for your grandfather, telling his story for the book was therapy for him. Maybe the film was therapy for you. To a degree, it, it, it very much was. Now, a huge part of this film is the Battle of the Bulge. It's such a famous battle. As we were talking about just a, a few minutes ago, there's such catastrophic losses. And one thing that comes through so clearly in your film is the fact that the American troops are already exhausted even before it begins. So set the scene for us. By the time they get to this climactic battle, what had your grandfather and his fellow troops already been through? They had been through uh, the Normandy campaign, which was very gruesome and bloody. And most people know about D-Day itself. But Norm the actual Battle of Normandy was where you actually got into the hundreds of thousands of casualties. D-Day itself at somewhere around 2,500, where that's a terrible day, but there were many worse days to come. And it, battling through the hedgerows and the, the, the graphic combat that they went through there and the immense losses that they took uh, was such a difficult thing for them to wrap their heads around that they were saddled with a very uh, subsufficient tank. And yet they just had to keep getting back in it. And they, they fought through Normandy, through the Battle of Falaise, uh, into the Battle of Mons, which was a major battle that few people know about, uh, across the Siegfried Line, fought in actually the Hurtgen campaign. So they were already into Germany, and they were the first unit in mass to cross the German border. And were well into Germany in December and had perceived that the war was going to maybe come to a close. The hope was that it would, Germany was on its last leg, uh, but then Hitler pushed this counterattack, which was a complete surprise. To They had many very depleted divisions along the line, uh, many either very green or, or very battle-worn, and so they ran right through a lot of the forces right along the uh, coming through the low shine gap in Belgium. And so it becomes clear in your in your film, they're thinking, yeah, we're about to get this break for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And then um, just these terrible things happen. The Germans show up and, and push a bulge into the line and are, are now headed west. Um, and you say that this kind of affected how your grandfather felt about Christmas Eve going forward. It, I, there was something that I didn't really see until later, and it's after learning all these things from him. But he, we used to have a very special Christmas in his basement, and he had a big fireplace down there, and used to keep it just immensely hot. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't take it in there. And I always wondered, was that because of how cold he really was on Christmas Eve? Because by Christmas Eve, they were completely surrounded uh, by Hitler's own division. And one of the discredits to history was the focus has always been, and rightly so, to people at Bastogne and Patton's movement up from the south for you know the courageous things that they did. But the first army actually 
took the brunt of the fighting uh, in the north, and that was where my grandfather was. He was part of the main attack force of First Army. And as, as we were saying, they had these tremendous battles even before this. I thought it was a fascinating note in your film. You say that Hemingway visited uh, near the Battle of the Hurtkin Forest, a major, major battle, um, and he thought that what he saw, he compared it to World War I. Correct. He called it Passchendaele with trees, and what he meant by that was that uh, World War I uh, devastation uh, type of battle where it's just fighting over these small swaths of ground back and forth reciprocating battle, and, and it was just costly and bloody, and it made it nowhere, and that's how the Hurricane Forest was, but in a forest as opposed to a plane. Sort of inch by inch. Mm -hmm. Now, Stephen Assad, he's a military expert that you interviewed for your film. Let's listen to what he said about the conditions um, during the Battle of the Bulge that Christmas season. The problem was, instead of trying to cut off the bulge when they had the chance at the base, they were so affected by what had happened in the bulge, the commanders, I mean, that they weren't about to take that risk. And so what they did is they pushed the Germans back. And that was bloody. And it took three weeks of very hard fighting when our men were mostly outside in a very, very bad winter. And I don't think that part of the battle gets any attention at all. Um, and that was, that was the victory, bloody as it was. When viewed that way, and when you look at the fighting contributions of individual units like the Third Armored or the Seventh Corps, you get a much different picture of just how broad the battle was and not just what popular history has chosen to focus on. The dramatic personality of Patton, the desperate um, stand of the 101st Airborne. That's Stephen Assad in Lubashevsky's film, Path of the Past. Um, did your grandfather talk about just how cold it was and, and how miserable these conditions were? He, he said that, well, most people uh, wouldn't know that uh, Sherman didn't even actually have a heater. So there was this really is the tanks that they were in. Internally, correct. And, and the, the Sherman, for all its many, many failings, it, it also had a, a very narrow track that uh, was rubber. It was what's called rubber, rubber chevron. And that would actually continue in snow like this. If it was packed, it would that 32-ton tank would actually slide uncontrollably. They had huge difficulty in any anything that was off the roads. So continually, they were stuck on the roads, which made them an easy target for the Germans. Knowing fully well, they would utilize only the roads to get where they were going. And how cold it was! You just imagine being inside something metal and it resonates the cold and a, a great illustration of that was Les Underwood, the tanker that served with my grandfather that I also interviewed. He said, if you want to know what it was like in the bulge, just wait till it's snowing outside and wait till it's below zero and climb into a 50 gallon drum and just hang out in there for a while. And that would give you an idea of what it felt like in that tank. That really hits at home, and it kind of puts in perspective any of our complaints about the weather today. I mean, this is, right. they were out there, and they were out there for six weeks. I mean, that battle lasted all the way till January 25th. You quote your grandfather saying, we lost everything in the Battle of the Bulge. They lost something like 14 tanks. Uh, do you think he felt a sense of destiny in having been one of the very few people who was spared? It, it was something that he pondered, I think, his whole life, and I think that was something that uh, really made him the amazing individual that he was that survived that. It's, it's what uh, uh, some people call uh, post-traumatic growth, and uh, actually our former Secretary of Defense uh, stated that. But uh, he was an exemplar of that. He, he really uh, lived his life uh, as an amazing, humble person. But it, would, it was because it was a trial by fire. And it, only he and 17 other uh, tankers survived the entire course that he went through. But most of them were lost during the Battle and of the And that's 17 out of how many? Uh, an original cohort of 152 in his company. Wow. And his division overall, as some estimates go up as high as 400 or 4,000 men that perished just in his division alone. Now, you interviewed um, an expert, James Peterson, who himself is a combat veteran, and he talks in the film about PTSD. Do you think um, that is something that your grandfather experienced in the, the clinical definition of, of what it was? I, I, I think so. I think all of them dealt. The, the, one thing that illustrates that very well was 
my dad's relationship with my grandfather, although they had a very good relationship later on, my dad would always stress when I was a kid going fishing with Grandpa, he was, he was a different man when I was growing up. And so they didn't openly deal with it or have the health care and, and facilities that we do now. And it's, I think there's a perception as if, oh, that generation didn't have that or whatever, but that it really isn't true. It was they just had the, it. They just didn't get therapy for it. Correct. And so it came out in other sometimes very terrible ways. We're talking to Lou Bashevsky. His film about his grandfather's experience in World War II is Path to the Past, and it's going to screen at the Soldiers Memorial downtown tomorrow. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back shortly to continue this conversation. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. That's 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. Welcome back. We're talking with filmmaker Lou Bashevsky about his documentary, Path of the Past. And today is the 75th anniversary of the commencement of the Battle of the Bulge. And that's a, a big subject in this uh, film, as it is in the book Looch, which Lou also wrote about his grandfather's life. Uh, Lou, one of the themes running through this film is just how terrible war is. And in this particular case, it, it was. Um, the incredible losses that your grandfather's company saw. And you followed in his footsteps by going over to Europe yourself and sort of retracing that path. How did being there on foot um, hit home what your grandfather experienced? I would say the, the most amazing aspect of that was I thought I had a sound understanding based on all the books I had read and I've talked to these various veterans and read memoirs and really dug deep into it. But to actually go there and to see these places and especially see the European side of it and the European photographs and the European information, a lot of which didn't come across the pond. We didn't see these photos. And even as a student of history, I have a degree in history from Eastern Illinois University. I never recall in any books seeing some of these more graphic images, especially of France and Belgium. I think they were more apt to show the destruction in Germany, but I don't think they wanted people to know how much devastation was in these com uh, countries that are, we we're supposedly uh, supposedly liberated. This might have been bad for morale. Correct. Now, some of these images, um, I assume these are the images that we're seeing in the film. These mm -hmm. are things that you obtained when you were over there? Yes. Uh, the Mons Museum in Mons, Belgium, uh, gave us some of the more graphic photos, especially of that particular area and in and around Belgium. I've had some contact with numerous Belgian historians that have helped me in that regard, a couple of which are in the film. And uh, there's also a lot of photos from uh, U of I archives, uh, which was very beneficial. It was not too far from where I went to school. And a colonel who was a third armored division colonel donated many things to the archives. There. Just by complete coincidence that they happened to be at the University of Illinois? Correct. That's amazing. And these photos, I've got to say, um, one of the best things about this film is getting to see these photos of the destruction. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And as you say, these haven't been widely circulated in the U.S., even Correct. among historians. The devastation was intense. Now, as you're over there, you're talking to a lot of Europeans. You weren't just following the path. You stopped, and it looks like you talked to so many people along the way. Some of them were absolutely fascinating. Let's listen to one of the conversations that you had, and this is with a man in Normandy. Hello, America! What? St. Louis. Saint Louis. Saint Louis. It's French. Yeah, it's a French. Yeah. 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 Jimmy Fallon. Yeah. Come have a drink yeah. here in Normandy. And I will, and I will teach you the right. We love you. We love you. The French love you. Jimmy Fallon continue on his way. And God bless America anyway. Oh, say, can you see about it on early life? Serious question. Say a lot of, about the Americans and their perception of, and, and what the things that they're doing now. What I mean, if, from a French perspective, what do you think that the Americans should learn from World War II? If you if you go to the cemetery, it's only it's only kids of 15, uh, 20, 15. Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. There was only uh, 17. What are you thinking about 17? Right. It was a war. I'm really imp imp impressed, impressed, impressive, impressive. 
euh, en français, euh, impressionné. En français, impressionné. But what you're doing by your grandfather's the, the walking. What you're doing for the memory of your grandfather's uh, And that's one of the French men that Lou Vyshevsky interviewed when he was overseas for his documentary, Path of the Past. Um, this guy's clearly just a character. <laughs> he, <laughs> so was, like we, he was hamming it up. Yeah, right. he, was, he was enjoying the fact there was a camera there. He does make a really good point, though. He's talking about how young some of these American troops were. Um, this, these uh, battles that your father or grandfather was in, he was 22. But a lot of these kids, they were fresh out of high school when they showed up in the European theater. Correct, and especially in late war in regards to the German forces. And, it, and it, he was talking about graves in Normandy itself, and we have footage of the graveyard that he spoke about. And it, you have kids that are 14, 15 years old. And at the same time, we were talking about um, the fact that so much of the Americans' bombing and, and of the Allied forces is what laid waste to these towns. So you could see they might have mixed feelings about Americans, and yet that does not seem to be at all the reaction you got when you were meeting the locals. No, uh, I, I think they're a lot of perceptions of the French uh, as being, you know, sometimes I, people think that the French are rude or something. Maybe that's the case in big cities, maybe in Paris or whatever. But I really, I, w- I was astonished at how much people wanted to help or contribute something or tell a story. And it, it was in those stories that you realize Americans were removed from the war in the sense that, okay, a soldier, an airman or a marine, sailor, they went to war in the Pacific or the, the European theater, and they came home, and they put that stuff away, and they didn't talk about it. Whereas there, everyone generationally was affected by this. Their grandmother had a story, their brother, their sister, their cousin, their, everyone, because even if their town wasn't part of the path of a major battle, they were still depleted on food, or there were still constant privations and things that they had to deal with that we don't comprehend here in the States. And that was probably one of the most profound lessons of filming this over there and having these discussions with people. Now, you're not a professional filmmaker. This was your first film. Um, yes. How did you get people to open up? Uh, I, I think it was it, it was the, the fact that they knew I was sincere about it and that uh, I, I, I have a luck uh, in, in that sense. I, I always like to travel and, and meet people. And so usually that's something that kind of luckily happens to me that I can find uh, fast friends and make conversations. And so once they knew that I was sincere about it, it wasn't some kind of cheesy, you know, uh, effort. It was really sincere. It, w- it was quite easy, really. How big of a complication was it that you don't speak French? It was very big, and thankfully I, I had at two points uh, two different uh, women that actually helped me as translators, one uh, named Karen Green that actually drove all the way. I met her in Normandy, and she actually brought over to another house that I met some folks that allowed us to stay there, and she brought shells and helmets and different things that she had unearthed in her garden from the fighting right nearby there and then was so moved by what I was trying to do and the conversations we had. She drove with her daughter all the way to Normandy and helped me translate for multiple days. And that's actually her job was a, as a French to English translator. That's what she did also for her full-time job, not Correct. just for you. Okay. Correct. We're talking to Lou Bashevsky about his documentary, That's Path of the Past, and um, it's going to be playing here in town in a couple places. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but this idea of getting people to open up um, and, you know, you have a translator involved. I understand you ended up talking to so many people, you couldn't even complete the journey the way you were planning to complete it. Tell us about that. Correct. It, initially, the whole idea was to bike the whole path, which would have been about 1,000 miles or 1,500 kilometers, roughly. And every city that I came to, it seemed almost, that there was somebody that wanted to contribute something. And I found it it took me in different directions, and it was way more important to get those interviews than it was to just bike the whole time. So I had to cut some of the biking down. But it was, for example, a great example is in Normandy, I, I... tried to go to a site was there was a famous battle called hill 91 and when i went to the site it had been commercially developed and it was like a car lot or something so there was nothing to film there it it would have been terrible so we decided to go step into a cafe and kind of regroup and think about what i was going to do next 
And it turned out the proprietor of the cafe was a collector. And it, tur- it turned out he had been collecting things from the ground and things that were left there from the battle. And I learned more in that cafe than I ever did at the actual site. And so there were just many things like that organically that happened. And it, it, it really seemed like kismet sometimes, especially the woman in, in Belgium that I met later on who had survived a attack of uh, – where they actually killed civilians in the towns of Hitler's own division, and my grandfather witnessed the aftermath of that. Uh, so your grandfather, by the time that you began turning this into a film, he had actually passed away at that point, and so many other people who were in that generation have now passed away. What kind of complication did that present that you weren't able to run things past some of the primary sources? It it, it was it was d- difficult, uh, d- definitely, to it, it, you could could only fact check you know so much except you know except from secondary sources but thankfully i had the book and all of those interviews so it was really easy to go back to that and then there there was a uh, so much information there in europe that kind of took it in another direction as well so it it wasn't as much just about my grandfather which i think he would have felt was very important mm-hmm. too and i think he would have very much appreciated going in that direction to talk about the civilians and and, and what they went through because he made it a point for us to understand what war was really like. Mm -hmm. And and one of the most graphic uh, things that he described, he said, in in Belgium, they actually would, upon taking a town, they were still fighting through and small arms fire was uh, going around. And he said, Belgians were so starved that they were climbing out of their houses through the muck and the dirt in the streets to go up to these horses, the Germans would use horse-drawn artillery, and the horses had been killed in the fighting, and they were literally cutting the meat off of those dead horses and putting it in pillowcases and burlap sacks and dragging it back under fire wow. in cases. Wow, because they were that hungry. That's how starved they were. That's that's what war is, is like, and that's what he really wanted people to understand it. It, it wasn't these glamorized things that you see in, in predominantly, uh, you know, all the movies. He didn't feel that sense of, of the glory of, of battle or the pride. Not of one bit. He was extremely proud of his service, no doubt. Uh, but uh, he, he understood the real cost. Having seen, he was almost kind of like Forrest Gump in a way because he had seen it, it, all these things that really were major events Although he just saw through his periscope what was going on, but he was really had his foot in some major, major incidents. He really did. Now, in your journey, was there ever a point where you wished, man, this is the one thing I wish my grandfather was still here so I could tell him this one story? It, the, the, it was probably most importantly the, the woman in Belgium who had survived in that small town. He, he and his cohort had pushed into this small town that the SS had lined up civilians and actually shot them in cold, but men, women, and children. And of all the reports and of his own conversation, he said that was where a lot of men just broke down and even know how, how much they had combat, they had been through so much, but to see children and old women and men, you know, gunned down in the streets, it was too much, even for those guys, as tough as they were. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that a uh, young girl survived that massacre. And, and it was just absolutely miraculous that 71 years later, I go to this town and it was in a nearby town just through a fluke. Someone said, oh, I know this woman that runs a hair salon and her mom survived. It's just classic small town connections. Right, right. And, and so, and, and I had thankfully Karen that tra- came out to translate uh, that day. Otherwise, we would have never had the complexity of conversation that, or come to the epiphany that she was right there on Christmas Eve when my grandfather was surrounded. And why do you think that story in particular would have been one that you, that you would have wanted him to hear? I think because the fact that the, the young woman survived mm-hmm. and that, that she That there was made, some good that, that came out of his battle? It, exactly, because he had gone into some of the homes and seen the things firsthand and said, you know, that was a, you know enough. He walked into one home and I said, did you walk in anywhere else? He said, I, I walked into one home and that was enough for me and what he saw on the streets. And there were a few huddled survivors that they found later, but at the time they had to push on. So I don't think he ever really knew if anybody from the town survived. And just knowing there was this one woman who not only survived but made it to old age, you think that would have made him happy? I, th- I think very much so. And, and, and not only that, she corroborated even the sounds that happened in the night that, uh, that he 
they were actually uh, surrounded and all their infantry were killed. And they were worried they would put satchel charges on their tanks and basically kill because the visibility of that Sherman was very bad among all the many other failings. And they thought, so they, they strung a perimeter of grenades around the tank and hoping, okay, that would alert them if the infantry was attacked. Now, this, this was Hitler's own division, the first SS, or what they call it, the SS Liebenstart. These was, weren't just ordinary German troops. These no, were the true believers. Right. These, these weren't, uh, you know, the, the Wehrmacht, which uh, they, they, they were everyday Germans, just like my grandfather in most cases, that wrapped up in this mess. These were, these were killers. They, they were responsible for the Malmedy massacre. They were responsible for the death of some maybe 200 civilians at Stevelo. Uh, uncounted groups all through their path. They just killed people just at random. And uh, so being surrounded by them that night must have been absolutely horrifying. But in the night, the, uh, the grenade perimeter that they put up, a herd of cows hit those grenades, and the grenades started going off. Well, when I relayed that to the translator, this woman started to cry mm -hmm. because she heard those cows get killed in the night on Christmas Eve in 1944. Wow. And how amazing that so many of your grandfather's stories are um, absolutely confirmed by this research that you did so many right. decades later. It, it still gives me chills. Yeah, like it, it just it gave just me chills, kind of, too. Right. It's it's yeah. such an amazing story. Now, um, I did want to make sure to ask you, I know this film supports a good cause. It's not just a good film. It's also there's going to be a benefit from it. Tell us a little bit about that. A, a portion of the proceeds goes to a group called Heroes Care, who's a it's a St. Louis based entity, and they do a lot for families dealing with deployment. And the main reason I wanted to do that was my grandfather, before he passed, he constantly read the newspaper. He was constantly uh, keeping himself abreast of what was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he was very troubled by he would he said himself, he said, I only had one hitch to do. I mean, that was one heck of a hitch. But when he was done, he was done. And he was very troubled by the deployments that our volunteer force is forced to do. Four, five, six deployments is not uncommon these days. And, and what Heroes Care does is help those families deal with that if one or more of the people are gone to help their family deal with whatever they can. And so that's why a percentage is going to them. And then also the event at Big Daddy's, all the proceeds from any of the tickets that we sell, it's uh, on uh, January 16th. That's uh, at Big Daddy's in Soulard at, at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, all the proceeds? Are... All, all the proceeds from the tickets will, will go to uh, uh, Heroes Care. Okay. And there's also going to be a screening at the St. Louis Holocaust and Learning Center on April 19th. That's in conjunction with the 75th anniversary of the liberation of many German concentration camps, which again is in um, your grandfather's Forrest Gump-like tour of duty, he saw that as well. We didn't even have time to get into that today because his story just has so many facets. But the, the number one screening for people who might be interested after hearing about this today, that's tomorrow at the Soldier's Memorial. Correct. Uh, um, that's at 11 a.m.? 11 a.m. And that's a free screening? Correct. Okay, so if people want to see Path of the Past, uh, they can do that tomorrow. Uh, Lou Bashevsky, thank you so much for joining us oh, today. Thank you for having me. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. That's 90.7. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.